Welcome to week five, Grace of the Second Week, Vocation. To begin with, we're going to journey back to the first week to look first at the examine. The relevant paragraphs in the exercises are paragraph 24 to paragraph 43. Recalling from the first week of the exercises that the principle and foundation orientates before God, the person as both creature and servant. It brings us to realise that false human ends are rather simple means and to remind us that the condition of indifference is necessary to allow us the freedom to deliberate without disturbance in the light of God. What follows is the preliminary action of purification, the examine. Michael Ivans, SJ, says that, quote, within the exercises, the particular examine served to sustain fidelity to the method and to uproot the weeds or thorns that might impede the good seed of the exercises. He goes on to say that the examine is a resource for life, helping a person to remain open to the action of the spirit well beyond the experience of the exercises. It must be made with discernment and be integrated into the entire process of ongoing conversion to be fruitful. It is part of a positive growth program. Pause here to read through paragraphs 24 to 43 before continuing. Ignatius had a deep understanding of the value of repentance as aiding a person to develop an understanding of themselves as belonging to the family of God. In the Jesuit constitutions, he considers this familial belonging as, quote, the hallmark of the Jesuits, close quote. David Stanley SJ claims that Ignatius's insistence on this examine as a daily practice is unique to him alone among the Christian mystics and proof that he shared the psalmist conviction through repentance of sin, a person will advance in love and knowledge of God. For we are the begotten of God. We see the practice exercised faithfully among the first companions of Ignatius. Since Francis Xavier wrote to Burr's, quote, twice a day or at least once, make your particular examines. Be careful never to omit them. Above all, so live as to make more account of our own conscience than you do of those of others. He who is not good in regard to himself, how can he be good in regard to others? Both Saviour and Favre received all of their training in the spiritual life directly from Ignatius. Saint Ignatius was very constant in this practice, carefully comparing examine to examine within a day and week to week. The dedication to this practice by the founder was continued throughout the society through the centuries. It has become a chief characteristic of the Jesuits. Remember the orientation of the exercises is expressed in its title, quote, spiritual exercises to conquer oneself and to order one's life without making a decision through any disordered attachment. A reform of life is an ascetical practice. It begins in the movement of the first week with the explanation of the particular examine about the particular fault or sin the person wishes to correct. When this is practiced, notations are made. The desired outcome of these examines is to direct the person to embrace Christ at the center of one's thoughts and affections. Christ is the one to be loved and followed and imitated. When Ignatius was trying to capture the spirit of the Society of Jesus in the general examine and in the constitutions, he placed the, quote, total abnegation of self in the foreground, close quote. The struggle against self and the acquisition of solid virtues, which is sought by these practices, are themes which successive generals of the Society have referred to in their letters to the Jesuits. Remember Ignatius was the first was first inspired to embrace a life of service of Christ by the struggles of the saints to overcome the self and to open themselves to God. In the saints of the society, these heroic efforts are evident. 
This focus dominates the literature of the society. Ignatian spirituality is above all a practical spirituality. The Jesuits return time and time again to the life of Christ, particularly his passion and his sacred heart. They explore our incorporation with Christ and of his life in ourselves. Jesus is always, for a Jesuit, both a leader and model. His mortal life is our ideal of a true life. While always it is recognised the importance of the role of grace plays in this struggle for perfection, it also requires clear effort of the one who seeks. Desiring to be dominated by the love of Christ, we will begin to think with Christ, act like Christ, be with Christ. The particular examine is a direct and methodical labour for the reformation of life. Therefore, Ignatian asceticism is the application of methods towards a reformation of life that moves us towards moral perfection. We must take the initiative and grace will then have a role to sustain and bring our efforts to fruition. How this is made explicit in the life of the seeker is through charitable works. Works of charity, apostolic works, are emphasised in the Jesuit spiritual tradition. Let's look at the parable of the kingdom. Pause here to read paragraphs 91 to 98 that commence on page 303 in the Indian text before continuing with the rest of the lecture. You'll note that the service of others is also a service due to God. The direction here is that this be prayed twice a day when the exercises are done according to annotation 20, that's during the 30 day retreat. The second week contemplates the revelation of who God is and what it is to be human. Most commentators agree that this exercise is one of the major components of the exercises. The other being the two standards. This exercise gives the maker of the exercises a new self image of one who is loved by and in relationship with Christ. Read note one. It says here specifically that this is an exercise, not a meditation or a contemplation. As I said, it's made twice during what is designated in the exercises as a repose day. It contains no triple colloquy. Its function is preparatory some commentators describe it as a second principle and foundation. The exercise is in three parts. 92 to 94 is a preliminary parable providing an introduction. 95 is the call of Christ to service in the kingdom. 96 to 98 contained within these paragraphs there are two levels of response. The second section is central. It is the invitation of all men and women to share in Christ's work and also in the cost of his discipleship. 91. The Call This is the call of an earthly king into service and links this to the call of a heavenly king, Christ. The first preamble, prelude. Note the phrase, seeing. Composition is made by seeing the place. Which place? Which place is Ignatius asking us to see? It is the Holy Land. This is a real place. All of our spiritual activity occurs in our world, not in some imaginary place like Wakanda, as we saw in the Black Panther movie recently. All of our leading people in growth in the spiritual life. It is not the aim of the director to take them out of the world, but rather to embed them deep in the reality of it. Just a little historical note, in one of the original copies of the text, Ignatius had crossed out the word temples and replaced it with synagogues. This more accurately depicts what was present in the Holy Lands. There is always a focus on the grace that I desire. 
While this is yet to take shape for the retreat retreated at this stage, here it is simply the capacity to be open to that grace, a readiness for it. Note too the repeated phrases such as come with me. To come with me is repeated five times in this exercise. Come with me, companion me, let us partner together. Another repetition is same, same food, same drink, same clothing. The focus here is that the retreatant should expect a roughness of lifestyle. They need to be open to take what is given in any moment. In paragraph 95, to see Christ, there's an invitation here to contemplate the risen Lord and to hear his call and then to join with him, to become, enter into a union with him. To conquer, all that is an obstruction to that union with Christ must be overcome. And to do so, we must labour with Christ in his suffering. Why do we labour with him in his suffering? So that we may also share his glory. This is not a robotic action. Reason and judgment are important. The use of the intellect in the spiritual exercises in prayer and contemplation is an essential aspect. Christ calls to himself thinking people. Not those who follow blindly, but those who have discerned that this is the pathway to freedom. This is the pathway to become fully human, fully alive. And in so doing, they then offer themselves totally for this service. Body, mind and spirit. But what sort of spirit? It's not just a matter of reason and thinking. We must enter into this relationship drawn by a spirit of love. It's the spirit of love that is the greater. This desire to serve Christ springs entirely from love of Christ. This is a higher order desire that transcends judgment and reason alone. Ignatius's view of service of God includes an ongoing commitment to God's work in the world and to be outstanding in that service at all times and in all ways, going against natural inclinations, or rather transcending them. And Ignatius here offers a way of responding. You don't often see Ignatius guiding the retreatant so actively, but in this case, Ignatius gives some guidance based on his own experience. Activity number one, pause here and taking about 30 minutes or so, reflect upon the kingdom parable. What are the main objectives? How might we deal with this parable in our contemporary setting? How might we adapt or substitute this parable without losing its function? Record your reflections on the forum on week five. Please also remember to respond to what other students have written in the forum. We're told that the Kingdom parable is a consideration. It's an exercise. This parable links the first and the second week of the exercises. It is a motif that the maker of the exercises returns to time and time again. Today we will have to adapt this parable to speak to today's retreatant and you've just had a, a small attempt at doing just that. You may like to continue to think of ways that this can be adapted. Howard Gray recommends that this parable be adapted using gospel stories. He gives an example of Luke 13 verses 10 to 17. Pause here and read this gospel passage.
This story speaks of the liberation ministry of Jesus, and this is the kingdom. The woman who was once bent over now stands straight. All in the kingdom are called to stand straight, to not be overcome by burden. You may have other scriptures that speak more readily to you of the kingdom, and you are welcome to substitute those here. There are two key dynamics that are at work in this kingdom parable. The parable, first of all, looks at the interiority of friendship with Jesus, and it's coupled with a mission to the world. The parable prepares the maker of the exercises to meet Christ anew, as both personal saviour and as Lord of all created reality. It is also designed to elicit a noble response from the maker of the exercises, drawing the maker into friendship with Christ and becoming one who wishes to enlist in Christ's service as a friend with Christ. This is perhaps articulated well in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. Pause the lecture here to read that passage. The great gift in this passage is the gift of identity with the Father by Jesus, who has called him and given him the identity of Son. In and through Jesus, we enter into the revelation of God. Remember, the orientation of the exercises, as Ignatius conceived them, was to ensure all interior efforts were directed to find and take onto oneself God's will, and in discovering God's will for us, our identity is revealed. Each of these exercises, meditations, contemplations are orientated to this end. The gospel plays an important role in the exercises, revealing the humanity of Christ to us. The infancy narratives introduce a number of themes. They establish the Trinitarian context, which is the paradigm through which all the exercises are viewed. Christ's mission is the work of the Trinity on earth. The implication of the incarnation is placed before us. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us as a little baby. The historical Jesus is important for those entering the exercises to grasp for fully. This child, this little child, is faithful to God. Jesus, even as a little child, is wholly committed to his mission. Yet, he is also obedient to his parents, living a life disciplined in the faith. Mary is moved by grace. It's grace that prompts her to respond to God's invitation. These graces are also available to the retreatant. The themes of poverty and humiliations that were introduced in the kingdom exercises are now embodied in the lives of Mary, Joseph and Jesus. Ignatius presents Jesus as a model of life for the retreatant, choosing between counsels and commandments. This is preparatory ground for the election later in the week when the retreatant must choose. In Matthew, the featured person is Joseph. In Luke, it is Mary. For Joseph, the revelation of God comes in dreams. For Mary, it is that she hears the voice. For Ignatius, Mary is the first discerner, the one who discerns the meaning of Jesus for her life. Joseph and Mary are the entrusted parents of Jesus. It is up to them to ensure that Jesus, the Son of God, becomes a good human. Joseph teaches Jesus the value of work and worship, and Mary teaches him the value of contemplation. The Incarnation, the Word becoming flesh, fully human. There was great risk in this. Jesus could have been stepped on by a donkey. Joseph and Mary were entrusted with keeping the child safe and bringing him up 
a faithful man, so that he too could come to know the Father. In our contemplation of these texts, we enter into, very deeply, the humanity of Jesus. We see, we hear, we taste, we feel his story. We also need to place our focus where Matthew and Luke place their focus, on the religious and doctrinal message of these narratives during our contemplation. These narratives must be, have been gleaned from those who knew Jesus as a child, as they could not have come from any of the apostles, who would have been the same age as Jesus and perhaps younger. But they remind us that when we contemplate sacred scripture, we must attend to the dialogue between ourselves and the gospel author. These texts are written post-resurrection. They are intended to be Christological. They are an interpretation of the events in the life of Jesus and they have been designed to teach us a truth. They are not intended to be simply biographical. They have been included in the scriptures to teach us about the nature of Jesus, the incarnation of God. They are full of post-resurrection truths and can only be read in that light. If we do not understand Jesus the man, we will not understand the God within the human experience, his and ours. How is God working in me? This is the question for us to ponder and we must remain open to grace to reveal the answer to us. A brief look now at Ignatian mysticism and Pauline mysticism. The prayer in the second week changes. I come to Jesus now as both a brother and a friend. I want to know Jesus that I might love him. It is important to have this movement towards friendship. Prayer is to ask for what you desire. Id quod volo. The interior knowledge of our Lord. Ignatius leads the maker to this. Ignatius shares his wisdom with us. Service of God as creator is also service to Christ, God incarnate. Reading in the letters of St. Paul, we see this as a major focus, the incarnation, the Christ, the Saviour. This must be achieved humbly through love of the poor. That's why Ignatius includes events in the life of Jesus which make him known, especially his sufferings, and that knowledge inspires love and desire for imitation. In the, in the spirit of the Society of Jesus, there exists a mutuality between prayer and apostolic activity, which we have made mention of earlier. Nadal, one of Ignatius's right-hand men, described the Society of Jesus as simul in actione completifus, which translates contemplative even while engaged in action. Nadal in his Examen Generale writes, quote, Father Ignatius, we know, received from God the unique grace of great facility in the contemplation of the Most Holy Trinity. This gift of contemplative prayer he received in a very singular manner towards the end of his years on earth, although he enjoyed it frequently also at other times. At that period, however, he possessed it to such a degree that in all things, in every action or conversation, he was aware of God's presence and felt a great taste for spiritual things as to be lost in their contemplation. In a word, he was simul in actione contemplativus, contemplative even while engaged in action, a habit he was accustomed to explain while remarking, quote, God must be found in all things, close, close quote. Nadal is convinced that this grace gifted to Ignatius has been gifted to all in the society of Jesus, and we therefore must conclude that this grace, this Ignatian charism, is gifted to all of us attracted to it. There is a continuity of structure to Ignatius's prayer, from his time at Manresa to the time he was elected as general of the society. Digobert 
describes it as the mysticism of service. The characteristic feature of this prayer can be found in two of the main exercises, the reign of Christ, paragraphs 91 and 298, and the two standards. Ignatius reinforces this in the mind of the maker, then turns to the meditation on the two standards. The two standards is a contemplation. The comparison here is between falsehood and truth. Christ is named first because he precedes Lucifer. This meditation orients the exercitor to examine the strategy of the adversary in comparison to the redemptive plan of Christ, who is, quote, our sovereign Lord and true leader. This is a meditation also of service. How shall I serve? It is a metaphor for discernment of spirits. This discernment is spelt out in more detail in letter four to Teresa Rajadell in 1536. This letter is contained in your text. In the Indian text, it can, begins on page 129. I'm going to pause here now for a short Lexio activity to contemplate the letter. What do we learn about Ignatius's understanding of discernment in this letter? Spend some time now and record your responses on the week five forum, spending about 30 to 40 minutes. When you finish the activity, continue on with the lecture. Continuing to reflect on the two standards, a life in Christ is compared to a life dominated by the father of lies. So whose child are we? We are guided through this reflection by gaining insight into the life of Christ. Christ again appears as a commander and is depicted as a figure of conflict. The fundamental grace in this meditation is knowledge. Christ's way and the antithetical way of the father of lies are held up one against the other. Christ's way is sacred doctrine. Lucifer is the deadly enemy of all that it is to be human. Jerusalem here is depicted as the peaceful city. Those called to it are also cause, called to build it through their service. The grace requested here is knowledge, knowledge enlightened by faith, a faith able to know the ways of Christ and the ways of the Antichrist and discern between the two. The two standards importance in the spiritual journey is noted by the commitment in the triple colloquy. The twofold concept of knowledge and desires in which that knowledge is embedded. To unmask the reality of the hidden power here at work. Another important meditation is the three classes of men. Earlier in this unit, we looked at the question of who I am, who am I? Here, we're looking at what manner of person am I? This meditation helps us to examine our own dispositions before we come to making a choice to the election. In the three classes of knowledge of Christ's ways is assumed. Emphasis here is on the presence of indifference, the condition necessary for an authentic and sincere commitment. Paragraph 157, the note tells us, it is to be noted that when we feel attachment to riches or repugnance with regard to actual poverty, when we are not indifferent towards poverty or riches, it is a great help towards extinguishing such disordered attachment to ask in the colloquies, even though it goes against our natural inclination, that our Lord should choose us for actual poverty and to desire, request, indeed beg for this, provided it be for the service and praise of his divine majesty. 
Before continuing to the next slide, take a moment to read paragraphs 165 to 168. Three kinds of humility. In the three kinds of humility, Ignatius places before us three degrees in which this withdrawal from self and towards God, the end of all our efforts, can have penetrated a soul in the moment it embraces God. Withdrawn from false gods, recall here the meditation on the Ten Commandments, we withdraw from the false gods of riches, honours, etc., but take a further step to abhor every type of sinfulness that would serve to obstruct our end, thus achieving indifference. The retreatant reaches a stage of choosing that which will bring glory to God and refusing that which is not sinful but perhaps would bring less glory to God. Here enters the concept of the margis, the more, the greater. We are encouraged to desire always the greater good, not just the good, the greater good. The intention here is for this to become habitual. Hence the ongoing daily examine which serves to refine this discipline. This process is one of reason enlightened by faith. Alert to the movements of grace in our lives, provided the retreatant finds themselves at least in the second degree of humility, they are able to make this discernment and enter into making a choice or an election. They are able in freedom to find God's will, liberated now from their passions, and open themselves up to receive the grace of revelation. The third kind of humility emphasizes the effective quality of love. These three texts, the two standards, the three classes, the three kinds of humility, according to Ivan's, represent a development. They flow on one to the other. They are a knowledge of Christ's way, a commitment to Christ's way, and a falling in love with the person of Christ. The triple colloquy here is a prayer for the grace of a greater love. What is the election? What is the choice? Before examining the text of the exercises, let us recall from scripture Israel's call to election. The Israelites were originally nomads. Their vocation is to be a people. The 12 tribes are called to become one people. This is their call to be fully human. They enter into a pact with God. The relationship they establish with God does not make them immune of the risk that all nomadic peoples face, but that God would be with them in that risk and that the risk would never overcome them. This is not some magical shield that miraculously occurs, but rather the knowledge and the understanding and the grace that their suffering will never be in vain. God becomes a kinsman to Israel, an avenger of wrongs, an upholder of justice. Pause here to read in Isaiah chapter 43 verses 1 to 7 before continuing with the lecture. In the first two verses, the prophet speaks of Israel's call to be the people of God as a call to be fully human. In verse three, he speaks of that vocation as an election. We know from Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses seven to eight, that this is not because of any special qualities they possess, but rather they are chosen because God loves them. It is the election that leads to unification. God's creation is good, creating harmony out of chaos. Israel, many people, is made one people. And finally, at the end of time, Jesus will send angels to assemble all of God's people. Scripture reference there is Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. While Israel is called to be a nation, 
Each Israelite is called personally by God. Each one of us is called personally to be fully human, fully alive in Christ. We are called by name. This is a basic vocation we share with all. God calls me and freely chooses me. I, in turn, must also make a choice, an election to answer that call, to respond to that choice, to make the choosing. Paul's the lecture here to read reflectively paragraphs 169 to 188. You may like to commit these texts to your prayer throughout the rest of the week. So in the text of the exercises, following the scriptural precepts, decision making always is relational. Ivans points out that a decision in the understanding of Ignatius as laid down in the exercises is twofold. Firstly, what is the right thing to do? And secondly, which course is more pleasing to God? A decision requires two conditions, that the decision maker is properly disposed to be open to God's word and that they are able to discern which course of action is more pleasing to God. That is why the first part of the exercises is designed to form in the retreatant the preliminary dispositions of a desire to love, glorify and serve God, indifference and effective freedom. So these dispositions need to be present. A desire to love, glorify and serve God. An indifference and effective freedom. In these times of election, Ignatius distinguishes three evidences to identify God's will. It is these aspects of the exercises which is Ignatius's great gift for the whole of life, not just the time dedicated to making the exercises. The exercises, as Ivan declares, are, quote, a school for Christian life, close quote, by integrating decisions of life into a person's relationship with God. When in such cases that there is not a clear need for a decision, because not everybody doing the exercises are doing them at a time when there is a definitive choice to make, some life-changing event, there is still a benefit in deepening one's spiritual life and strengthening their relationship with God. Decision making is a major element in Ignatian spirituality, but knowing this, it must never be forced or manufactured, nor should it be oversimplified. The exercises may bring clarity in an ongoing and extended discernment process, and the gift the decision maker with prayer tools to arrive at a choice for the better long after the experience of the exercises has ended. This concludes this week's lecture.